and by thanking the uh, planners of this event and uh, thanking the speakers. I've learned a tremendous amount today. And thanking you for your perseverance. I could use a cliche and say we're nearing the finish line here, but actually it's, it's not a finish line. I think it's a beginning line that I hope will lead to a lot of cross-disciplinary uh, discussion within the university and without. Obviously my topic, um, healing gardens and healthcare facilities, <clears throat> actually if I had my druthers, I would change it in light of our medical students question, I think I would call it, trust your inner ass and follow the dogwood. But uh, <laughs> too late for that. So uh, now I think I should uh, define what I mean by healing, so you know where I'm coming from. Uh, health to me is not the absence of disease. And the verb to heal means to make whole, uh, to make whole physically, uh, psychologically, socially. They're all interrelated, as we've heard many times today comes from the Middle English uh, alien, which uh, we derive our terms whole, wholesome, and sound. So I'll be talking about gardens uh, that make whole, especially through contact with uh, nature, with the natural world, which is the particular uh, healing power of gardens. Now, I won't dwell on this, but uh, in medical facilities, and I'll be confining myself primarily to the American scene, some of the, the more recent research into this, most of the healing gardens and medical facilities today, whatever they are, uh, general hospitals or outpatient clinics or whatever, are intended to relieve stress. Uh, not only the stress of the patients, but of the physicians, we've heard about that, what, 46, 47 percent uh, are stressed, uh, and also the families themselves. So there are three constituencies of that uh, healing gardens address the needs of. And of course, the uh, tremendous negative effects of stress on the immune system we, we've heard about. Now let me make uh, a few points about uh, healing gardens, uh, how they're designed and where they're designed. Healing gardens are directed at a specific medical context. There's not such a thing as a generic uh, healing garden. Not only are they directed at a specific uh, medical context, in, in this case, the Joel Schnapper Garden at the uh, Terrence Garden Oak Hospital in uh, New York City, it primarily addresses the needs of uh, AIDS patients. So they're specific to uh, certain uh, medical symptoms, but they also are uh, designed by uh, a team, not just by um, the landscape architect or the architect, but a team of physicians, nurses, therapists, the patients themselves, families of the patients, uh, also the maintenance staff, and uh, also uh, someone high in the hospital administration who uh, handles the budget. Because uh, often there's a misunderstanding that these gardens are a frill. Uh, often uh, they're the first thing to uh, disappear from the budget when the budget goes over. Uh, so you need the, uh, the CEO there uh, participating in this design so, so he or she can understand uh, the importance of these gardens. Now, they also, if you look at a healing garden, often they look like, well, you know, they look like a, an ordinary garden. If you look at Joel Schnapper, uh, yeah, I mean, it's lush. It uh, has some colorful plants, has this lovely uh, pergola here with a wisteria vine and so forth. But if you look a little closer, you'll begin to see uh, these features that are designed specifically for HIV positive patients. For example, uh, depending on the progress of the disease, there are different degrees of light sensitivity. So here you see uh, deep shade, dapple light, sunlight giving uh, patients a choice, giving them uh, a certain amount of impairment. Notice, empowerment, excuse me, uh, notice the uh, height varying in, in the various planters, because this garden in particular has a horticultural therapist who uh, works with the patients to grow things, which is very, very therapeutic. So we have uh, varying heights of planters here, so you can garden standing up, you can garden uh, sitting down in a wheelchair and so forth. There are chairs that are very flexible, so you can have different uh, group arrangements. There's even a performance space here where the uh, patients uh, can plan their own uh, musical concerts.
concerts or, or what have you. Also, the pavers, notice how carefully they are spaced. The joints are very small to, uh, to avoid bumping over them in wheelchairs or ivy poles. So you can see how this is a garden that exposes people to nature and its healing power, but at the same time, uh, the details in the garden are directed at a specific condition. Now, you might ask, well, can we just translate uh, the qualities of uh, gardens into these uh, healing contexts? And the answer is yes and no. It depends on the context. Uh, for example, flowers, this wonderful herbaceous border at uh, Dumbarton Oaks, designed by Beatrix Farron. Uh, there are certain conditions where flowers uh, simply will not do in a healing garden. For example, uh, catering to cancer patients who may be nauseated by all different kinds of smells, sweet smells, food smells, and so forth. In this uh, cancer patient's garden in the uh, Virginia Commonwealth University Cancer Center, Roger Court, designed by Roger Courtney, there are no scented plants whatsoever. Uh, there is some color here, but uh, um, for obvious reasons, these plants are, are not introduced into this context. If you don't know what you're doing, if you don't confer with the medical staff, you can create more problems with healing gardens than, than you can address. Now, briefly, how do we know that uh, these gardens have positive health outcomes? And here's going to be a little bit different uh, <laughs> uh, outcome than, than uh, Peter's uh, father's example of the wall. But uh, in, in the early 1980s, a cultural geographer by the name of Roger Ulrich uh, posed a hypothesis. He said, with views out hospital windows uh, of natural scenes uh, have positive health outcomes, how would they affect, would they have positive health outcomes for patients? Would, would it reduce stress? Uh, would they get out of the hospital perhaps sooner? Would they take less medication? Would they also complain less? That was his hypothesis. So without going into great details and doing him a, 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 an injustice, because this was a very carefully wrought uh, experiment. He took a 200-bed hospital in Pennsylvania, took patients on the same floor with identical rooms, except half the rooms looked into a brick wall, half of them looked into a park-like scene. Actually, I, in, by way of disclosure, this is a view out my kitchen window <laughs> in my neighbor's house, but uh, you get the, uh, you get the, uh, the difference here. Uh, the patients have the same operation, gallbladder removal. They uh, have the same nursing staff. They did not have the same surgical staff. And they were screened for uh, diabetes or any kind of health problem, uh, smoking, obesity, and so forth. So uh, at the end of, of a year, uh, their medical records were examined. And the ones that had the uh, view of, of a park-like scene out the window got out sooner, took less expensive uh, painkillers and complained less. So this uh, experiment has been uh, replicated uh, a number of times with uh, pretty much the same results. It's what we call evidence-based design. Now evidence-based design, without digressing too much into it, it's about 20, 25 years old. It, uh, the literature varies enormously in terms of uh, quality and reliability. But at its best, it does uh, measure health outcomes, and it is uh, randomized, it is double-blind, uh, like Ulrich's study. Some of the studies are not this way, but I would say that the evidence that is, that is produced by this is not, um, it's not like lab science. You cannot uh, quantify things as precisely, but it's strong, uh, what I would say, circumstantial evidence that uh, certain features work, such as the view of the park-like scenery, except uh, one has to continue to test this. Part of the weakness of evidence-based design is it has not been replicated as much as it should be. Now, with, uh, with our new imaging technologies, particularly uh, fMRI scanning, we're learning more about the, uh, the effects of the environment on the brain, and also by uh, using digital technologies to mock up different types of medical environments, put EEG caps on people, which are a heck of a lot more affordable than an MRI scanner, and, and uh, see how, uh, what the effects are of these uh, digitally produced environments. Now, this is at the University of California, uh, San Diego, 
where this is not a garden, but uh, they're, they're testing wayfinding through uh, a hospital to see where landmarks help people. We know within a medical building, uh, confused wayfinding is a great stressor. So they're testing here, how can you lead people through with landmarks and the like. Now, with those preliminary remarks, let me uh, quickly go through two case studies of uh, two different types of healing gardens that are directed into two very different medical contexts. The first is the Life Enrichment Center. It's, it's an adult day care, uh, care center in Kings Mountain, North Carolina, uh, designed by uh, landscape architect uh, David Camp, who's an alumni of this pro alumnus of this program. Uh, it's this, in this day care center, I think you know what it is. Uh, people are dropped off during the day, they're picked up in the evening, they have activities during the day. 85% of the people in this facility are suffering from some form of dementia, uh, either vascular dementia, but uh, more percentage-wise, um, Alzheimer's. So this will be a garden that will cater to these particular constituencies. Now we know from um, the symptoms of Alzheimer's uh, and, and dementia, loss of memory, which means also spatial confusion, uh, loss of the ability to find your way. Also proneness to uh, claustrophobia. Uh, we also know that uh, sometimes vigorous walking will, will help to, to quiet uh, Alzheimer's sufferers. And also just being in a natural setting itself has a calming influence. And there's study after study that uh, have shown this. Also, uh, there's a tendency to wander off so that any Alzheimer's uh, or dementia garden has to be fenced. So if we look at this plan very, very quickly, you'll notice it does, uh, it does have a fence, but the fence is very transparent, almost invisible. I'll show it to you in a moment. It uh, is deliberately designed that way to undercut these feelings of claustrophobia. You'll also see that uh, it's a tripartite garden. It has three parts. It has a porch for socializing. It has what's called an activity garden that's very simply designed on a central axis ending with a flagpole and a cross axis terminated by uh, two uh, <coughs> trellises. This is an activity area. Uh, there can be gardening here with planters. There can be crafts and flower ranging here. Uh, this multi-use space is uh, used for all sorts of things, ball throwing to build up stamina. Uh, actually, we were doing a documentary film here, and uh, the, the uh, patients were cruising around in wheelchairs, squirting each other with water pistols on a hot day, having a great time in this space. So it's programmed for the routines of this particular facility. The flag that terminates the uh, central axis uh, the old veterans will raise and lower the flag. There are all these different groups that uh, will feed the birds here, replenish the bird feeders, or they'll do the flower ranging. There'll be all sorts of tasks, their, their interior tasks as well, uh, in the kitchen and so forth, that builds it a quieting routine for these uh, dementia sufferers. The porch, the activity garden, the final part is the strolling garden, which is intended to uh, to allow for that outburst of energy and, and walking off uh, agitation and so forth, but you'll notice how it loops back on itself. There is no choice. There's no corner that you lead people into, but uh, it simply loops back and the porch itself becomes uh, a beacon. It's almost like a lighthouse where you can constantly look back and see it and orient yourself along with that simple axis, cross axis design. I haven't got time to go into the building, but it has the same kind of sensitivity. I'll just point out that the common space, the dining room, uh, opens directly to the garden, and they are, it's visible from within, and uh, it's the interior and exterior spaces are carefully correlated with each other. In, in this section, you can see the three parts, the porch, the activity garden, and then the uh, strolling garden. Actually, the slope drops off here, and that fence is uh, virtually below grade and, and almost invisible. 
quickly uh, some of the details here. The porch, uh, it's the gathering area. Some patients uh, who have great anxiety will not go beyond it. The uh, paving is padded uh, to cushion falls. The, you'll note the modulation of light that uh, it, it, it creates with these transparencies of the roof itself a, an intermediate uh, degree of light between the interior, this space, and the exterior. People with cataracts uh, are bothered by glare, so the, it gives their eyes a chance to, to adjust. There's a raised fireplace here for uh, different activities. And the architectural expression itself, I call it neo-colonial perhaps, uh, which is part of the architectural expression of Western North Carolina. So the building itself is a familiar building. It's not something unusual, so people have a sense of uh, you know, familiarity. You can see how the uh, porch itself is that beacon that I was talking about. You can look right back uh, directly to it from wherever you are uh, in the garden itself. And then just showing you a little bit of the cross axis, the uh, raised planters, you can, you can garden with, uh, with a walker or you can do it from a wheelchair. Uh, notice how this particular zone is differentiated uh, with the contrasting colors so that uh, people that have, are sight impaired can, can locate it. And then the walk width themselves will accommodate two wheelchairs side by side or uh, persons walking around talking to each other and that's one of the trellises. And I was talking about that particular one is used for horticultural therapy. Here you can see the cross axis, the, the flagpole, again, just how clear uh, that spatial organization is, so it's not going to confuse anyone. There's also a small vegetable garden. Most of uh, these people have, uh, are from rural backgrounds, and the act of gardening itself, growing the vegetables, bringing them to the table to eat is, uh, is a comforting activity. You can see the fence here that I was talking about. Here it's very visible, but it's very transparent. It's, it's uh, painted what I call a Charleston green. It's a very, very uh, dark uh, green. And then the straw garden itself, Phoebe was talking about uh, multi-sensual dimensions of, of spaces for meditation. Certainly all great gardens engage as many senses as possible. Uh, here, these wonderful grasses uh, create a tactile sense, which is very, very calming uh, to many of, of the residents here. Uh, the birds singing, you know, I don't have uh, any, any sound recordings. Uh, the light, the fresh air, all of these things, the, the ability to walk. Notice how the, the walkway curves around. There's a bit of mystery to it, but uh, you always have that beacon to, to look back to. The benches along the way, they're oriented either to look back towards the facility or to look out into the landscape itself. And surveillance here is very important because the staff has to keep an eye on everyone, so this garden is very open, so you can, you can pretty much see what's going on from inside the building or at any point outside. And I just, uh, I've been talking about the, uh, the Alzheimer's and, and dementia sufferers here, but uh, I know I, I was around this garden for a week uh, shooting a documentary film on it. And it's very meaningful to the staff themselves, even though the garden is, is directed towards the specific needs of dementia sufferers, the staff uh, find that uh, being in the garden themselves increases their ability to be the professionals and the compassionate caregivers that uh, they want to be. So let me uh, conclude with just one more case study. How am I doing time on? Yeah, that's good. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the first garden of its kind. Uh, the Oregon Burn Center Garden uh, in Portland, Oregon, designed by uh, Teresa Hazen, who is a horticultural therapist and a horticulturalist and a very, very fine uh, garden designer. This garden is about uh, 10 years old. And as far as I know, I don't know if any other garden of its kind exists now. So if we look at the plan, the building isn't shown, but the Burn Center building is here and here. It's an L-shaped building. Uh, this is a, a major road located here and a service drive here with a high wall around it to completely uh, buffer that out. Patients here are of all ages. 
Uh, many of them will be confined for uh, weeks or even months. So this garden is particularly designed to, to bring them into nature and its healing powers, but also to address their particular symptoms, such as sun sensitivity and that sort of thing. The, the garden has a very lush border, as you see here. It has, this is the main entry from the, uh, the hospital itself. There's a minor entry here for the staff garden, which is separate, and then a, a small entry here for service. But the main entry is here. There's a circuit walk, uh, walking to, to build up stamina. Anyone who's been hospitalized knows how quickly uh, <laughs> you begin to lose uh, muscle tone and everything else. Uh, and to build uh, the strength of patients, this is deliberately designed to help them to, to walk. And along that perimeter walk will be a series of pavilions that are, that are shaded, a garden for the staff, and I pointed out a shed for storing uh, maintenance tools, but also horticultural therapy things, uh, pots and uh, trowels and that sort of thing. A uh, pavilion here for, that allows uh, different degrees of light, depth of light and uh, shade. A dining area here, which has been replaced with, with another facility that I'll show you in a moment. And then this circular area here, uh, with views across the garden itself, which allow uh, simply for you to sit quietly and to look uh, into this view that is uh, replete with all sorts of lush plants. This central piece here is also for uh, strength rehabilitation. It has a, a slight grade on it, so if you're in a wheelchair or if you're walking, uh, you can walk up the incline and down, and it, it will help to rebuild uh, your body that, that often has been in the bed for uh, several months. Showing you the, uh, the entry, the, uh, just like at the, at the Life Enrichment Center, uh, patients don't step out into the bright light, but they, the light is modulated with uh, with this overhang here, this canopy. Uh, in the early stages, many only come to this edge there and look into the garden because of their, of their skin is so sensitive to any kind of, of sunlight. These are the pavilions, which are the entries there, and I'm gonna move around uh, clockwise. And the plan, you can see they're very transparent. They, they allow uh, a lot of fresh air. They're, uh, the screen allows anyone sitting there to look into the lushness of the garden itself. You'll notice also the chairs are movable. You know, families will sit here with, uh, with their loved ones, uh, their board games, discussions, or uh, simply picnicking in these. Uh, rather ingenious designs in which these shed roofs uh, direct water into the plants behind them and, and, and act uh, to help maintain the garden itself. We know it rains a lot in, uh, in Portland. The, uh, the walking uh, dimension of the garden is carefully measured, so uh, you can measure your laps uh, and, and convert them to, uh, to miles, and it's on a sign. The uh, pavers, you'll notice, are quite large, and uh, the, the joints, again, are very, very fine for the same reason we saw at the Joel Schnapper AIDS garden. And this curvilinear geometry, which is uh, these beautiful gra graceful curves, contrasts with the uh, medical environment on the interior. There, there is some evidence-based design to show that the geometry of these gardens is important. Uh, lush plants, yes, they're a necessity, but uh, graceful curvilinear lines of this sort are, are extremely restful in their counterpoint to uh, the medical environment. Since this caters to children, uh, there is a <coughs> children's garden located here. Uh, local artists are commissioned to design these, uh, these place structures. You'll note the use of color. Uh, this particular turtle is uh, amusing, but also children can climb on the turtle, uh, tend, you know, build up their own strength, or if they're there with their siblings uh, who need something to do while mom and dad visit the patient, they can play out in this garden as well. So it addresses uh, various age, age groups. This is the staff garden. I mean, you can imagine working with burn victims, extremely stressful work, people who are in intense pain. 
So here, the staff is given uh, their own garden with their own entrance uh, into the hospital directly. It does give way uh, into the regular garden itself. If they, can, if, they, if they need to just unwind and have a few moments, you notice they can't be too far away from the patient. Uh, there's this small staff garden. That was the uh, kind of pergola I was talking about that gives uh, different degrees of light as we move on around. You can see deep shade, and then there's dappled light here, and again, very movable chairs. A little bit of whimsy, humor in, in the medical environment is a very tricky thing, but uh, these whimsical birdhouses are cobbled together with uh, recycled things like a coat hook or uh, with a doorknob and uh, what is it, a transistor insulator off of a telephone pole are, are just meant to be a surprise and uh, something that will uh, maybe create a smile. I don't know if the birds like them that well, but uh, anyway, they, uh, they're interesting. But here to me is, is one of the most moving and amazing things in this garden. It is a play firehouse. And it was added by uh, the child psychologist and psychiatrist in residence to help children play at putting out fires and other things to, to somehow not repress the trauma of, of, of the very medium that has some material that has injured them, but to come to terms with it and, and to deal with it. So there is a firehouse, it's got a fire bell. Uh, you'll notice uh, a play fire engine that can go around the uh, perimeter, a wheel vehicle, a, sort of a fire museum with, a, with a, a raincoat and a fire helmet and an oxygen tank here, uh, a hose bib here, it's, it's, I mean, it's a play hose, but nonetheless, um, in the accompaniment of a therapist, not alone, uh, children work through uh, these uh, traumatizing memories uh, through this uh, particular uh, vehicle here, which is provided by the, uh, the local fire department. Finally, uh, also I've talked about the lushness of, of, the, of the planting. In the quiet zone in the corner, uh, there's a lovely fountain. Peter was talking about the water. You can tune a fountain uh, like you can almost tune a musical instrument. This fountain makes a wonderful trickling noise. You can simply sit on one of these benches and look across. That's the view roughly from that bench looking in that direction. A close up of the fountain itself, and there's the view of that uh, what I would call a rehabilitation walk that has a slight grade that cuts across uh, the middle of the garden. So, I hope by um, those introductory remarks <coughs> and then uh, showing you a couple of uh, case studies, you get some sense of the uh, healing power of gardens in uh, medical facilities. So, thank you very much. for everyone. Um, you most recently brought up the uh, contrast between curvilinear lines that are graceful, um, that aren't commonly noticed in medical establishments. I'm curious uh, what the other, other panelists have noticed as well in terms of how um, uh, curvilinear lines versus rectilinear spaces um, may, if you've noticed if there is any kind of difference in terms of playing a role as facilitating mindfulness or, or not, or what your take is on, on that contrast? Well, I think it really depends. <laughs> um, but certainly one strategy that many contemplative spaces use is to juxtapose the kind of constructed environment um, with the natural and you know, this word nature is dangerous, of course, but so the, the notion that when we look at vegetation in the garden, for instance, or the comparison between the hospital and the garden, the hospital has a certain geometry which is that way because of a lot of reasons, you know, papers and chairs are square and, you know, things like that, it's got a sort of drawn around room. 
Um, but at the same time, that kind of juxtaposition between uh, an orthogonal and a curvilinear geometry is a very powerful thing. And when we think about the kind of relationship of, you know, I don't know, person to nature, um, that that counterpoint between them is, is important. I think the other thing is the role of light and shade and shadow. And so I think in all our talks, you've seen examples of that where, like in Tadeo Ando's work, he usually uses very strong orthogonal forms, but or some kind of subtle curve, which then tracks the sun and the, 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 the impact of those shadows themselves in producing other kind of geometry. So it's that kind of interplay. So Maybe not uh, either or, but both and, or as Venturi talks about, not black and white, but gray. Uh, the condition of uh, gravity is a vertical one, and as you walk on horizontal surfaces, that just kind of appears to move in the sky like that. And one architect, Arube, first one I saw in my teaching, said he was from Switzerland, and it's the role of the Germanic nations to the north and mountains as well as. The Latin culture of the Mediterranean, so it's a diagram in both and, and maybe not exclusively either or. That's why day and night, like morning and evening, is recurring. <laughs> it's difficult. In, in architecture, tries I think to actually have a di dialogue between these positions of the world again and again as we turn to our respect. Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, what I said about curving the new lines is one of the more controversial areas, but to pick up on what uh, Phoebe said, and I should have pointed this out in the slide, in that Berne Garden itself, you will see that the pavilions are very rectilinear and they're played off against the uh, curvilinear geometry, just as, you know, in a, in a Japanese in uh, Abbott's um, room, often the uh, Soji screens slide back, but they're very rectilinear and they look out into a very organic landscape. The uh, also, I should say that uh, architects are beginning to incorporate curved spaces within buildings. Now, I could have given a lecture on our new cancer center here, the Imnikura Cancer Center. But if you'll note, uh, the hallways there bow. They, they bend at a considerable expense. That was almost value engineered out of the building. But uh, the reason for that, there are studies that show long views in one point perspective down these hallways that are cluttered are very, very depressing to people. And I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. So by bending those walls a bit, uh, it, it, it does have some uh, positive psychic response. I just returned uh, about two weeks ago from a trip to Malta, where I went to see the Halciflini Hypogeum, which is one of the oldest human constructed spaces that we have, although it's built into the ground as opposed to above the ground. But what's very unusual in particular about that space, although it's, it's so old that, that archaeologically there are a lot of arguments about what it is, is that it has extremely unusual acoustic properties. And there are some theories that the acoustic properties of that architecture were intentionally created with contemplative states of mind in mind. So uh, Professor Crispin, you said a little bit about the acoustic or oral qualities of architecture. But you tended to talk about, well, whether it was the sound of water or, or sound dampening. But then there are other examples in uh, European cathedrals where there are particular sweet spots clearly meant to, to emphasize or, or amplify the voice of the speaker. And I just wondered if you had any more observations about different architectural structures or, um, or the relationship between acu the acoustic element of architectural structures and contemplation directly. Well, I, th I think certainly for designers, the importance of acoustics is, is right up there with you know light and air and a lot of other issues. So the fact that we're using this microphone in this room, actually this room could have been designed more effectively so that that wouldn't be necessary. 
And so there are acousticians that architects work with, if you're designing a concert hall, actually the entire shape of that space itself is dependent on the acoustic properties that one is seeking, whether it's chamber music or a symphony or an, or, or an opera. And so certainly, you know, 2,000 years ago, people were thinking about that as well. They didn't have the same ability to calculate and, and model that space in advance of construction. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they were, they were definitely doing it. Um, and we think about a lot of the most powerful, I'm trying to think of examples, there are so many, but a lot of the most powerful spaces um, that are, I'm thinking, I guess, more religious spaces at this point, but often spaces like you mentioned, the Gothic Cathedral. Um, there's a very specific program for um, sound in that space, and whether you use uh, hard surfaces to create a kind of echoing environment or something where you actually want to quiet the sound and dampen it. Um, so yeah, I think you're right. I don't know. Um, when I think about the, the one center I showed, the Buddhist center in New Mexico, and it was following a, or translating a kind of traditional Buddhist temple um, form, even the use of the tatami mats and the kind of soft material, which would then, you know, quiet and, and, and um, kind of dampen that sense in the space is really important. You might think Just, of uh, of one um, small perspective is that uh, there's an understanding that long before architecture, people danced and they sang, and they made space by the break of sound, their voices together with animal sounds, and I've seen this in ancient uh, Indian research, but they danced, and there's a book called When Columns Dance, that people were dressed up in white togas or in lines just like square dancers and all these other things. We make space among ourselves without architecture, and did it, and the Parthenon is very much uh, suggesting that there was once a deep forest, there was lots of columns, but people also went from the marketplace up to it twice a year to celebrate harvest, and they made spaces first with their bodies as they circled around and looked out to the Aegean. So <laughs> it exists out in the world before. It doesn't begin with architecture, it begins the human sounds and our capacity to form circles and squares and things like that. Just a quick reply. Um, I think sound is one of the really unexplored areas in medical facilities. Now we have uh, music and uh, music therapy programs and spaces that would be designed to, uh, to complement a piano or, or a harp or whatever it is. But let me distinguish between sound and noise. Noise is the number one stressor in a medical facility. and. Uh, Again, I'll take the example of our new uh, cancer center. Uh, it is one of the quietest buildings you will ever encounter. And so there are great links have been taken to dampen uh, sound within that building. So uh, there are different types of sound, obviously, but I just want to point out that noise is, is a rip, it's a problem and it's the number one stressor. One more. So one more question. Um, I just have a practical question. I'm very happy that the cancer center um, did go ahead and did the curve for but is anything being done to document the value of that so that in future buildings that doesn't become a problem? Because I think it's so much more, I work in a round building, and it's so much more user friendly to me. It feels organic, it feels better. That's a very important point. Um, the answer is yes, that there will be a, what we call a post-occupancy evaluation, we call it pose, <laughs> uh, of that building. And certainly the effects of the curved walls will be part of that. Uh, I think what we need is a series of case studies of